The following program is made possible by friends and partners of the Quick Study Television Ministry. Thank you for your support. The modern war against Israel cannot be won. We live in the end times. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. You are tuned in to the Quick Study Television program, and we'd like to say welcome to everyone listening on 9330 Shortwave Radio around the world and also on your iPods. And today we focus going through the Bible on Ezekiel 39. This is interesting. Some of you may realize the war of Gog and Magog, but today we're going to talk about technology versus God. I mean, we have great war machines in the world today, so how can God possibly stop that? Is God subject to our ideas and our minds? That and more coming up in just a moment as we talk about the end of time. Corey is here with Bible Archaeology. Corey? I am, and today we are exploring the ancient city of Babylon. <laughs> Babylon, mm -hmm. and this is the ancient, you mean the, the one where the Saddam Hussein city. started to rebuild mm -hmm. some stuff there. He did. Oh, that's going to be a good one. In modern day <laughs> Iraq, Bible Discovery TV Challenge. In the scene of the Valley of Dry Bones, how many times did the Lord instruct Ezekiel to prophesy? Two, three, or four? In modern worship, the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ often expresses its praise and honor to God with uplifted hands. Indeed, the psalmist tells us in chapter 28, verse 2, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands towards your holy sanctuary. There are many times in the scriptures that show God's people lifting up their hands toward him. Did you know that the lifting up of hands was and is a common practice in the ancient and recent Eastern cultures? It's a sign of a covenant, a mode of expressing surrender. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 22, when making an oath to the king of Sodom, Abraham says, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord Most High. This was a sign or a symbol of oath to God by recognizing God's superior power and authority to hold Abraham accountable. about to explore the layout, the history, and the archaeology of a very important and pivotal city within the pages of the Bible. Specifically here in the book of Ezekiel, it comes to play a lot because this is where Ezekiel is living. I'm talking about the city of Babylon. The Babylon featured in the Bible and dominant during the days of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel is known today as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. After years under Assyrian control, Babylon had broken free and defeated Assyria by teeming with the Median Empire. Famous King Nebuchadnezzar, while he was still Prince Nebuchadnezzar, had married the Median princess. After much warfare, Nebuchadnezzar, who became king when his father died during their campaigns, returned to his capital city, Babylon. And there, he began more aggressive campaigns. This time, they were constructive. Nebuchadnezzar built his palace, many buildings, strengthened the walls, 
and built one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Legend has it that Nebuchadnezzar built the gardens as a present for his Median queen, Amethyst. Ancient historian Herodotus visited the city about a hundred years later, still raving about its beauty and impressive construction. The city straddled the Euphrates River and boasted an 11-mile-long outer wall with eight fortified, decorated gates. The most famous is the Ishtar Gate. Its remains were removed and today are displayed in Germany. Nebuchadnezzar used fire-baked bricks to build Babylon. These lasted longer and held up to water damage. What made Nebuchadnezzar's bricks unique is that he also had his name stamped into them. It's interesting that the book of Daniel may allude to these practices. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into a massive furnace, probably one of the kilns used to make these bricks. Daniel also records Nebuchadnezzar's ancient boasts, and those are paralleled in the practice of stamping his name into every building, literally building the city on his own name. This is interesting. Today our study, Ezekiel 37, introduces the stunning vision of the valley of the dry bones, the valley of death. And then the breath of God through prophecy invades the dead valley and a resurrection brings up the nation of Israel in the last days. This is now happening. We see it in the news in our modern times since 1948. Chapter 38 takes us to the land of Gog and Magog in a famous battle to try to destroy Israel. The whole world will come against Israel. This eerie vision looks identical to our present geopolitical conditions now. The entire world gathers against Israel in an effort to wipe them from the face of the map. And the land of Gog and Magog is connected in the Bible with the son of Noah's son, Japheth. Genesis 10.2 and 1 Chronicles 1.5. As the modern political climate continues to move against modern Israel, Ezekiel begins to look like the cover story of a present-day news magazine rather than ancient words from the past. Ezekiel 39 verses 1 through 8. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. And I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand, and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops, and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog, and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 1 through 8. When I was young, I grew up and I loved technology. Developed uh, as a ham radio operator early in my years. And I was going to go only into the technical side of Christian television all my life and radio. I was engineering broadcast radio at stations like KSOH down in Arkansas and KITA. And of course, over at Far East Broadcasting Company, did some work on antennas over there just for a few weeks. And so these are the kinds of backgrounds that I have. So I have gadgets. I love gadgets. I love technology. Today, I want to talk to you about 
the difference between God's technology and man's technology, and there is a difference. Technology versus God. We speak of the war of Gog and Magog today. Now, in Ezekiel, the study today takes us into this passage. Here is the word of the Lord, Ezekiel chapter 39. And you, son of man, prophesy against God. And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. And I will turn you around and lead you and bring you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your, out of your right hand. And this brings us to this image of all of the world coming against Israel. But here is the point. The modern war against Israel cannot be won. We are in the end times. God has promised to fight for his people. If you go back in recent history, since Israel became a nation, and you look at the great struggle of the presidents of the United States and the world leaders, you will discover that 65% of the United Nations resolutions involve Israel more than any other nation. It is Israel and Jerusalem that is the subject of conflict these days. It's not the fault of God's people. It's the end times in which people, others, directed by the hate spirits of Satan, want to hate and kill men. You see, those of us who truly understand God and who He is would not want anyone to die, for we are all His creation, every nation, every creed, every person, every culture. Which brings us then to Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 4 and 5. The scripture says, You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all of your troops, and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey and to every sort of the beast of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open fields, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Now, it gives us to this particular power connection. The more modern man ignores the promises of God, the more God will show his promises to his people who don't ignore him. The promises of God are getting richer and richer, uh, not because they are uh, any greater in volume, but because evil is getting worse and worse, and there is a separation. And God is showing the difference between those who he loves because they love him and those who he will not protect because they hate him. Now, God doesn't hate anyone, but the truth is that there are many people on earth who hate God. And so God removes his protection. They want nothing to do with God. And in these times, God is showing to those who love him special provision and protection, the promises of God. So Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 6 to 8, talk about this end time war again and say, And I will send fire upon Magog, the land to the north, and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known among the midst of the people of Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Brings us to power connection number three. Soon God will make himself known among nations who have chosen to abandon his word. And they will be sorry that they abandoned God's word. I can't think of any other name in the world that is more mocked and misused than the name of Jesus Christ. Have you noticed that? Why do the writers and the actors and the producers in Hollywood insist on using the name of Jesus Christ as a profanity? Why? Uh, why don't they use some other name? Well, beloved, that's all going to be corrected someday. And those who mock God and those who ignore God and willfully hate God will come to terms with the reality that God exists and they will come to this place. They will realize one day that it is the very God they mocked and swore with that gives them the very breath with which they use profanity. And what an awesome and horrible 
terrorizing reality that will be. So for the believer in Jesus Christ, when we look at this end times war, we need to be faithful. We need to pray for all the nations of the world. Uh, we need not become involved in polarization or marginalization or one man come up to me and he said, Pastor Rod, you know, these nations are saying they're going to wipe out Israel. I just, I said, hold it. Hold it now. You need to pray for those who curse you and do good to those who despitefully use you. Matthew chapter 5. You need to remember that God is not slack concerning His coming, but He is patient, not willing that any perish. We must pray for a revival awakening among all the nations of the world in these end times. Ezekiel 42 or Ezekiel 39 reminds us. you and I spoke about the where, and the where was ancient Babylon. Now we're going to explore the when. When did Ezekiel write these prophecies, and what was going on in the political and social arenas? Take a look. The empire of Babylon fought its way to supremacy. It systematically overthrew its major competitors and then focused on lesser nations. At the time, the nation of Judah was one of those lesser nations. King Josiah of Judah, who had risen to the throne at the early age of eight, had focused his reign on ridding Judah of idolatry. When Pharaoh Necho of Egypt marched up through Judah to help Assyria fight Babylon, Josiah interfered. He tried to fight Egypt off, but Egypt won. Josiah died and Judah became subservient to Egypt. However, this didn't last long. Assyria lost the war against Babylon. So did Egypt. And that's when Judah got its first visit from Babylon. During the reign of King Jehoiakim, Babylon took valuables and people of rank to Babylon as tribute, a sign of Judah's loyalty to the new empire, the first exile, which included the prophet Daniel. The second Babylonian exile came several years later during the short three-month reign of Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin. After dethroning Jehoiakim for rebellion, Babylon decided to take his son as well. This time, they took Jehoiachin, his family, his court, the military, and the skilled workers of Jerusalem, plus all of the valuables from the temple. This second exile is when Ezekiel the prophet was taken. The book of Ezekiel tells us that Ezekiel was from a priestly family, and his visions began five years into this exile. The destruction of Jerusalem occurred just six years into his role as prophet. Nebuchadnezzar had set up Zedekiah as subservient king in Judah, but Zedekiah plotted rebellion. The resulting war brought on a two-and-a-half-year siege of Jerusalem, ending with the destruction of the city and temple, the final Babylonian exile. Portions of the Bible were not translated into English until the 7th century AD. Even then, it wouldn't be until the 15th century that a full English Bible would be present. Therefore, bishops in the church would hire artists and commission them to paint and draw images with specific Bible verses underneath them in order to create teaching tools for the church. This was very offensive to the Orthodox Jews since they understood the second commandment of the Ten Commandments to mean never to make an image in any form of God or His Word. But by the 5th through the 7th century, the church leaders had prevailed. We know these ancient art booklets as Florilegia, which is from a Latin word that means little booklets.
Quick Study Television now offers a new series exposing the truths about the Bible buried in the popular notions of secularism. Was the tomb of Jesus Christ really found as so many seculars claimed recently? Was King Herod a real Bible character or fiction from the New Testament? Where did the Dead Sea Scrolls really come from? And what kind of boat did Jesus fish out of? Find out these answers and more in Legacy Pictures and Quick Study Television's offer this month. Four award-winning video documentaries with a fifth special video documentary called The Western Wall Tunnels, discovering what's hidden under the Western Wall. This is a one-time only unique offer from Quick Study Television that every Bible believer should have in their video library. Perfect for Bible studies, discussions, and for building your Bible knowledge. We need your help as a ministry right now, especially in the summer and fall. We're suggesting a special $25 gift above and beyond regular giving to help us stay on the air and continue broadcasting. When you give, we will send you this five documentary video series called Unearthed Ancient Riddles from the Past Explained. Right today, send to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Or in Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also call for faster service or go online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Now it is easy to be caught up in the winds of man's technological advances, buy into the idea that humanity has outgrown the Almighty God. In the last 2,000 years, even many in the church have vowed to worship the God of chance and evolution, and somehow we just evolved, expunging the idea that God could possibly create a universe in six miracle days. This is replacing the God of miracles with Mother Nature. So the doctrine of evolution seeks to remove any miracle of a working deity. But those who remain faithful and trust God's word will be rewarded by the miracles of God's provision. And that's one thing we need to remember. When we don't see the miracles of God, it's because we've chosen not to see them, not because he doesn't perform them. Now it's time for today's Bible Discovery TV Challenge. In the scene of the Valley of Dry Bones, how many times did the Lord instruct Ezekiel to prophesy? Two, three, or four? You know, I'm having trouble remembering. <laughs> I'm going to guess mm -hmm. three times. Good guess. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And you can check that out in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 4, 9, and 12. Well, Quick Study Television is a program that takes you through the Bible in one year. And one of the things we like to do every once in a while is stop. Now, the picture of the day will come back in a few days. But I wanted to take a little time in these segments and look at Babylon, ancient Babylon, mm -hmm. which is in modern-day Iraq. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, did you know the cell coverage in ancient Babylon is better than many places here in cool. North America because the, the infrastructure there was built uh, by the U.S. Corps of Army Engineers and, and some of the best engineers in the world. And uh, so it's really interesting. And the infrastructure there, the communicative infrastructure is, is enormous. And ancient Babylon is the site where Ezekiel prophesied from. Yes, that is true. And today we're going to look again. This is another picture. I wanted you to see it again. And this is the image at about 12,000 feet. Saddam Hussein, you'll notice the line, was building canals. He was building irrigation places. And mm -hmm. you'll see that there. And he had a structure that created a triangle. His his particular palace was in the upper left-hand side of that picture where the Quick Study logo is near there. And then to the right over under today where it says Babylon today, there's a big structure there and then with a pool around it that he put in there. And then down through to the bottom of the image, there's another one. that Those three triangles represented where his entire complex was going to be, just his complex. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, a big part of that when the U.S. military came in with the coalition forces, was overrun and taken and barracks were put in for military protection. So here we see this recent interest and, and Saddam Hussein was building this. 
This is the Ishtar, the ancient mm -hmm. Ishtar Gate, Corey. Yes, it is. Now, it's a little bit scaled down from what it originally was, but that's the throne room on the other side. Mm -hmm. This He was building King Nebuchadnezzar's throne yeah. room. Yeah. And he thought he was the reincarnate of, of King Nebuchadnezzar. This is fascinating to me hmm. because the scripture tells us that there will be a violent destruction True. of Babylon. There never was. Babylon faded away. When the Persians took it over in 539, they kind of just walked in. And, but they never, there never was this violent destruction. Not what, totally, yeah, like the Bible says. And, uh, and Isaiah, both mm -hmm. Jeremiah and Isaiah talk about in one day, in one hour, mm -hmm. Revelation, and in mm -hmm. one hour, the destruction, the smoke of you has been one hour. Mm -hmm. What can destroy an entire city in one hour? Yeah. And you look at what the results of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and you realize that we are definitely in the end times. And this, of course, is what my good friend John Wesley White talks about in his book, Thinking the Unthinkable. So this is all interesting. Pay attention to this as we continue to study on. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 11, 12, and 13, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. He who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. You see, it's not... It's not a ritual or burning a candle or going to confessional or any of that. What it is is a knowing the Son of God, a taking the Son of God, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and your Savior. John, the great apostle, the great saint, tells us it is through our relationship with God by confessing our sin to Him and accepting what He did on the cross, not by our works, but accepting that He died on the cross for our sin and accepting he rose again to give us eternal life. Come to Jesus today and ask him to come into your heart. Thanks for joining us today on the Quick Study Television program. Remember that we are taking enrollment now in students at Bible Discovery Seminary. This is online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Now, this is in cooperation with Phoenix University of Theology, so why not join us and find out how you can learn even more about the Bible? Join us today, BibleDiscoveryTV.com.